you, an amazing patriot of the American Revolution, Red McCoy, enters the assemblage dressed in the period clothes and carrying other garments and some accessories. These are Redden's Recollections. Good evening, everyone. My, my name is Redden. Uh, just a minute, let me set this down, and, and then I'll proceed. No, oh, uh, Good evening again, everyone. Good evening. My name is Red McCoy. If I seem a little unsteady up here, it's, well, it's only because I am. No, you don't, you don't make me feel uncomfortable or unsteady or, or uneasy. It, it, it's my advanced age. I feel good. Still get around pretty well. Just a little unsteady. Speaking, speaking of advanced age, <coughs> Would anyone here care to guess how old they think I am? No? Well, I, I turned 75 just, just about a month ago. September 29th, to be exact. And a, and a, a quick cipher would determine that this is October of 1832, and, and a quick cipher would determine that I was born in 1757. That's not proof. That's not proof of my age. The proof of my age comes from the register of the time made in my father's prayer book. That, that prayer book's now in my possession. I was born in that part of South Carolina that's now called the Marion District, where we lived till, till I was about 12 years old. In 1769, my father settled in that part of Craven County, and it's now called the Sumter District, where I've continued to reside ever since. You know, if you had a 1825 Mills Atlas, you'd find a map in there that shows the precise location of my home, which is just about oh, 10 and a half miles from here as a crow flies. <coughs> Of course, if that crow has to walk and pull the carriage, it's nearly 15 miles. <laughs> I, I like to think that perhaps I, I made that carriage ride a, a little smoother. When in 1798, I served as a road commissioner on a successful petition to the South Carolina Senate <coughs> to build a new road in our area, smoothing, smoothing out that carriage ride. Both my farm and home, and this is just a little background, both my farm and my home are situated in what was once called Claremont County. Claremont County was formed up, I think, a couple of years after our Revolutionary War, around 1885, 1785, excuse me. 1785, and, and much of it's bordered on Clarendon County at that time. Claremont County wasn't, didn't grow that old. In 1800, Claremont County, Clarendon County, and Sumter, excuse me, Salem County were merged to form the Sumter District. And many of my neighbors and I, though, those that have been living there a good number of years, still refer to our district as Claremont County Sumter District. Do any, do any of you refer to your district as Clarendon County Sumter District? No. Well, for me, old habits are hard to break. And goodness knows, there's a lot of jurisdictional changes to keep track of in all those many years going on in South Carolina. Well, enough on that. that that's, not, that's not really what I came to talk to you about. What I came to talk about is well, what I said down here a few minutes ago. Well, not exactly, <clears throat> but, but it's certainly related to that. Why, why do you suppose that I dug out these old clothes and other gear that I've had stored in that trunk of mine for around 50 years? Any 
about to happen again? No? Well, it's to help prove up a claim. Well, let, me, let me explain. I, I was recently told the news published in the Columbia Telegraph that the U.S. Congress had passed the Revolutionary War Pension Act of 1832. And I understand that that Pension Act awards full pension benefits to anyone that served for at least two years, conditioned only on you proving up your service record. I think there were some partial benefits for those who served less than two years, but anybody that served two full years get full pension benefits. Well, that, that, that should apply to me because I served the better part, better parts of, of seven years. And I thought that I'm meeting with my neighbor, Judge William Potts, tomorrow, who, who's agreed to help me prepare my pension application. I, I think he's done this before. And I thought I should probably arrive prepared with a, an account, an account of all of my, my service record to share with Judge Potts tomorrow. to got to make his job a little quicker and easier. And I thought that, well, although I've made an account of many of those actions that I participated in, but I thought, well, maybe, maybe donning these old clothes or other gear that, that I, I was wearing when I came home from the war, that prompted me to recall more than I otherwise would recall about my military service. Don't know if that'll work. Well, let's, let's, let's find out if that works. Or even, even if they still fit. Well, the, here I have an old, an old hat. And one of my, one of my good friends says, well, really, that, that thing's not even going to fit you anymore. you got the big head ever since you served as a real commissioner. Well, he's wrong. Now, my head may have gotten bigger, but probably got less hair. Yeah. And here's here's an old honey frock I got in there. That, that thing's been in there 50 years. Mm. I don't even don't even know if I washed that before I put it in. <laughs> but maybe that'll prompt me as we going through this to recall more of my my event. Anyway, here, here, here's an old pouch that I carried. Whoa. Here, here's a pouch I carried. Not the belt in there someplace for it. But this has got this has got a game of graphs in it that we should play sitting around the hey, sit set around a campfire sometime. Wait. And here, look here, I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten that's in there. That's that's a uh, that's a compass and, and a sundial. I could probably use that. Who knows the way I'm forgetting stuff. I may need it just to get from the parlor to the bedroom. <laughs> oh, but here, here's one of my, this is one of my favorite to keep safe. This old wooden canteen. Probably dried out too much now. That it probably won't even hold water. I hope I, I can make my story convincing enough that it'll hold water so I can get on that bed. Anyway, right here it's got Marion's Brigade, South Carolina. I think a friend of one of my little sisters painted that on one of my last trips home in, in 82. Best I remember. Anyway, that's one of my that's one of my favorite you can say. I, I don't I don't know how many details will be needed by by Judge Potts, but I'll just try to give him a an account of all my recollection that I can come up with a military service from 1775 when I was first enrolled to 1782. I hope my memory will serve me well enough I can at least qualify for that pension application. As I said, I have already prepared some, some of the accounts of my, of my military service that I'll share with you and, and, and Judge Potts tomorrow. And, and if, 
while we're going through them, if I happen to think of maybe some other things, or maybe my memory is jogged a little bit, I may make a note of them too. That is, if this trimmer in my left hand doesn't keep right knocking the writing instrument off the desk. And some of my friends say, Fred, that trimmer is a product of the war. I say, well, no, I just think it's a, one or the other, goes with the other infirmities of old age. Well, what, what do you think? No? Well, let's, let's start at the beginning. I don't even think I want to use that spectacles. Let's start at the beginning. I've made, like I said, I've made some notes that I'll refer to, may read them, and, and then if we come up with something else, I'll, I'll make a note of that as, as we go along. This is what my earlier account says. <clears throat> the best I remember, I entered the service for my first draft in the latter part of 1775. And that, of course, was in my home colony right here in South Carolina. Sometime around my 18th birthday, as I recall. I do remember this. I was enrolled in Captain Moses Gordon's company of Colonel Richard Richardson's regiment commanded by General General Richard. Wait a minute. Now is that is that right? I, I seem to recall that there was General Richard Richardson Sr., but I I think he became a general much later in the war. And and I know he had a son, Richard, Richard, but not even sure. I'm not even sure that he was in the service at that time. You know, you know, he had another son, Virgil, who's now his name, who became governor of, of South Carolina. I, I should remember that. He, almost a neighbor. We don't live that far apart. I, I swear I can't recall. But I'll, Judge Potts, who's about 10 years younger than me, he may remember a little better. I'll, have, I'll leave my note the way it is for now, but I'll ask him tomorrow what he thinks it was. Anyway, as there was no active military operations in South Carolina going on at that time. So we just stayed a month or two months at that time, after which we were released and sent home. My next note reads, from this time after being enrolled and sent home until February of 1779, I was frequently called out for a month or two months at a time under different officers, but the time or length of my service, I cannot now distinctly recollect. I do remember being called out one time in 1779, and we were marched from Charleston to Savannah and back to Charleston. But I think that was, that was much later than 1779. Uh, let me make a note of that. I recall that during one of the many times I was called out, I also, let me go back to 17, said February of 1779. I was again drafted and went under the command of Captain Nathaniel Moore, whose first lieutenant was John Jennings. The other officers not now recollected. The field officers of the regiment were Lieutenant Colonel Singleton and Colonel R. Richardson. Well, there's Colonel Richardson. I'll have to ask about him. I'm pretty sure this was Richard Richardson Jr. in 1779 because I think Richard Sr. was a general by that time. I was with Captain Moore's company when we marched from Charleston to Perrysburg and then on to Hamburg opposite Augusta where we remained two or three months under command of General, general Williamson. While stationed there, the detachment frequently sent to the other side of the river under the command of Colonel Hammond after the enemy was stationed in Augusta. I do recall recollection that one skirmish whilst there that I recall was a place called Spirit Creek. I was not engaged in immediate attack but was placed on the flanking party to prevent surprise to our company. And this is Expedition. I served under Captain Shadrach Edmonds, or maybe his name was Edmonds. I, 
I cannot distinctly recall. I do know that in this skirmish, eight enemy were killed, six prisoners taken, but, but no officer of any note. Oh, yeah, there was also a skirmish at Briar Creek during this time, at which we took six or seven prisoners. Let me make a note of that. Afterwards, General Richard Williamson and his army returned to Charleston in advance of the enemy under British General Prevost. Prevost remained a short time before the town and then retreated <laughs> up the Stono River to Savannah. <coughs> this went on this enlistment, I continued on duty in Charleston until a short time before it was taken by the British. On this tour, I was out of active duty as first sergeant for one year and two months. Let me make a note of that time. As I recall, I was then relieved by new draft and sent home. While I was home on a short visit, I learned of the surrender of Charles to British General Henry Clinton on May 12, 1780. For some reason, I sometimes want to think it was Lord Cornwallis, but that's not correct. Cornwallis was second in command to General Clinton. Only later did Cornwallis assume command when General Clinton sailed back to of course, it's believed by many that that was one of the greatest defeats by our, 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 the Patriot cause and one of our saddest hours. Due to the surrender of Charleston, many South Carolina militia units and all the active Continental units in, in the college that were in Charleston at the time, and most of their officers became prisoners. Some were later paroled, including General Richard Richardson due to his failing health. He died a short time later, as I recall. Here's what I said in that, an earlier note about this. Quote, At that time, there were no regular drafts and no companies raised, but every man would, that was anxious to fight for his country, for the country, joined Colonel Marion or Colonel Sumter as a volunteer. A little, little of my prior war experiences, even as a first sergeant, during the five years preceding, had prepared me for what was then to come. I mean, I mean, it's over. As I recall, it was the late summer of 1780, about the time that General Gates came to Camden, that I left home and traveled by myself to join Colonel Francis Marion and his brigade of South Carolina militia. Colonel Marion at that time was on the Black River near a place called Put and Swamp. As in my prior service, I, I was given the rank of first sergeant and placed in a company commanded by Captain John Nelson, or, or maybe it was Nielsen, I'm not, I'm not real sure. I do recall that one of my first duties was to go with Colonel Marion and helped destroy the boats on the Santee under orders from General Gates. That was supposedly to prevent their use by the British to escape from Gates' army after the pending battle of Camden. And as you probably know, the British didn't need any boats to escape. After the battle of Camden, Camden at which our, our brigade did not directly participate, I was with Colonel Marion on his retreat to North Carolina. That retreat was necessary due to the overwhelming size of the British force sent against him after Gates' terrible defeat of Camden. My neighbor, Judge William Potts, who I mentioned earlier is going to help me with my pension application tomorrow, recently reminded me that he saw me with Marion and his brigade of about 60 men when we stopped by his father's plantation on the way to North Carolina. Judge Potts was only 13 at that time, but recalls it well, and said his father and older brother joined a brigade and left young Potts at home to take charge of the plantation. Here, here, here's another of my earlier notes. I also recall that sometime, but, but I'm not exactly sure when, after joining, joining Marion that week, quote, 
march from Black River to Snow's Island at the junction of Lynch's Creek and the Petey River. This was a favorite place of retreat for him and his men. And from this place he made frequent excursions against the enemy when he could hear of detached parties of them about the neighborhood. I was still with the brigade when we went against and defeated the enemy at Black Mingo in September 1780. And it was after our, the brigade returned from North Carolina. We returned to South Carolina when we fit, learned that the, the large force sent it against Marion had been recalled. Trying to remember the correct sequence of all of the various actions that after the Battle of Black Mingo gets a little confusing to me. I, like most of my compatriots, didn't carry a journal, and there was a lot going on at the time. Plus, as I previously said, uh, that was a long time ago. Let me see if I can recall some of them in no particular order that might help support my pension application. Perhaps I can sort the order out and add some approximate dates a little later. I'll probably make some notes and go along. I remember one time Marion came under General Green and we marched up the Santee toward Camden, crossed the Santee and joined Sumter and Hampton at Orangeburg and attacked the British at Sherbridge Plantation. Now I recall something that helps me clear up my earlier confusion. <laughs> Colonel Richard Richardson, Jr. commanded the Berkeley County Regiment of Militia at this engagement. And my company was under Captain John Nelson, was attached to Colonel Richard Richardson's regiment at Sherbrooke. I was sure that I'd served under Colonel Richard Richardson, Jr. at some point, and if not in that earlier engagement. I just couldn't recall it earlier. Maybe this hunting frog shocked my memory. And I have another earlier note. I was also with Colonel Marion pursuing Watson from the Santee down Black River to Georgetown. We attacked him several times in the routes, and this I'm quoting from my earlier note. We attacked him several times in the routes, and firing upon him but being inferior in number to the enemy and scarce of ammunition, we had to retreat and intercept him again at places favorable for attack. Oh yeah, I was at, I was with Marion at the taking of Fort Watson at Scotts Lake with Colonel Lee, as well as the taking of Fort Mott by Lee and Marion. We we could talk about that those two engagements for some time, but you've already heard Ed Fort talk about the fort not too far earlier today and last year there was <coughs> the taking of Fort Mott. This this backdrop shows. Fort Mott there that might be interesting for you to observe. I really don't need to add anything to my brief account should, and it should be sufficient for my pension application. Besides, I have an affidavit to support my account of these two engagements of another soldier that was with me that was engaged. I also was at the evacuation of Georgetown in the taking of 80 prisoners from a school <coughs> at Simmons Plantation. Spell Simons, but it's pronounced Simmons, I think. And I was also at the attack by the British when Big and Church was burned. Let me make a note of that. One more thing. I was at the Battle of Stono and the Battle of Quinby Bridge. And I was with Marion at Georgetown when his nephew Gabriel was captured and killed upon the enemy learning that Gabriel was Colonel Marion's nephew. Sad day. Here's one of my last notes that I made earlier this week. I well recall that in early September of 1781 that I was attached to a party under the command of Lieutenant Lewis after some Tories who were committing depredations about Camden. Whilst there, the Battle of Utah Springs took place. I rejoined Marion the second day after the Battle of Utah at the same place where I left him. 
There were many other small skirmishes, the times and places I do not, after 50 years with any detail, recall. My final note from earlier this week, I continued with Marion in the neighborhood of Charleston until a, within a week or a fortnight not night, of the evacuation of the British in December of 82. I was at home on a short visit and with the intention of returning and was about to return when I heard that Charleston was evacuated. I then learned the troops would be dismissed and did not return. From the time that I joined Marion in the fall of 1780 until December of 1782, I was constantly with him in discharge of duties of my company as first sergeant. I was never at any time being absent for more than a few days when I visited home. Should it be important to my pension applications, some of the other officers' names that I remember serving under include General Lincoln, General Huger, Colonel William Washington, Colonel Lathorse Harry Lee, as well as Colonel Worry and Mayo. Although it is impossible for me to find living witnesses at this time as to the precise, precise time and that I entered the service or how I served in the different periods, I trust that my recollection, together with the two affidavits which attest to my Revolutionary War service, will be enough to qualify me for my pension, recently passed to the U.S. Congress. One of the affidavits will be from Judge Potts, who I said earlier recalls seeing me with Marion when our brigade retreated to North Carolina after the defeat of Camden, of Gates at Camden. And Judge Potts also affirmed he saw me on other occasions when he visited Marion's camp on Snow's Island and other places near his father's plantation. As I mentioned earlier, I also have the affidavit of one of my brigade compatriots, William McIntosh, who lives in Salem County, Salem County, Sumter District, and who served with me at the takings of Fort Watson, Fort Bonham. Well, I guess that's about it. Unless you have some questions, I'll, I'll bid you good evening.